Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the chance to come to Brazil and talk. Um, it's been very interesting uh, workshop so far. Um, so if it's not uh, clear from the sort of cryptic title and abstract, um, I'm a mathematician and not uh, a physicist or a biologist. So the, this talk might be a little bit weird. Um, but uh, so, so the results here were all, were all uh, we're all worked on as um, pure mathematics results, uh, but I, I've always thought that there should be an application to biology of some of these ideas. So hopefully I'll convince you that that might be the case, and um, I'm, I was excited to come here for the opportunity to maybe get um, ideas for how these sort of mathematical ideas uh, might be applied. Anyway, so let's get started. Um, so. The main motivation is to have some rigorous geometric framework to statistically analyze shapes. Uh, by shape, I specifically mean um, a similarity class of a curve in Euclidean space. Uh, so for example, you might take outlines of planar shapes, uh, and these would be relevant to something like a computer vision algorithm, where you want to teach a computer how to distinguish between like a dog shape and uh, a cat shape or something, right? Um, by similarity class, I just mean if I take this uh, dog shape and I sort of stretch it uniformly, and maybe rotate it around or translate it, I want to identify that with the original shape. Okay, So shape-preserving transformations are, are all sort of grouped together. Um, and then, so you might also talk about closed curves in, say, R3. Uh, these would be like level sets on a surface or something, um, also for computer vision. And then the relevant type of shape uh, for this workshop would be like open curves in R3 as protein backbones. Um, so I want some rigorous geometric framework for analyzing um, open curves in R3. Uh, so in particular, I need some distance metric between the shapes. Um, OK, so you know, there are various distance metrics already exist, but uh, this is sort of a new idea for how to construct a distance metric. And the idea is to. Uh, Treat each shape as a point in some Ramanian manifold, and then use geodesic distance as a similarity measure. So let me clarify what that sort of means. Um, OK, so here's sort of a schematic picture of, of the idea I'm proposing. Uh, so we have a couple of shapes here. They're sort of both helical structures. One has a little tail on it. I want to think of each of these shapes as a point in some manifold, so in a, a, at least a locally Euclidean space. Um, this is just a schematic, so the manifold is two-dimensional, it's a surface. In practice, the, the space of shapes is going to be very, very high-dimensional, uh, or perhaps infinite-dimensional is the formalism I'll be using. But uh, as a schematic, this works. Um, okay, so I have you know, a pair of points on this manifold. There are many, many paths joining these uh, two points on this manifold, infinitely many paths that you can take. Um, so here's sort of a, a not very efficient path. And you can just sort of randomly move from one shape to the other. Okay, um, Sure, that, that is a path in this manifold. So you, you have to remember, since this is really high dimensional or infinite dimensional, you should visualize paths as curve evolutions. Okay, So at each time along this path, you have some curve associated to it. OK, so, so that's one path you might take. Here's a sort of obviously more efficient path, which is just to sort of straighten out the ends of one of the coils into uh, a little tail. OK, so, so visually, that, that just seems obviously more efficient. Uh, we want to make that idea rigorous. OK, so in this setting, um, sort of the most efficient path is called a geodesic path. So this is, in this case, a curve evolution. And it's optimal with respect to the um, geometry of the manifold. Right, yeah, so there's all sorts of questions like this that um, are sort of the technical meat of it. But uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to really be thinking of this set of points as my manifold, or the set of shapes as my manifold. So it's some very high dimensional um, manifold, actually. So each shape has one point, yeah. Um, and then, OK, so now here's my distance metric. It's just find the shortest path joining these things and measure its length as a path, OK? Um, so in case anybody's a little bit rusty on some of this terminology, let me maybe just remind you of some of this mathematical terminology. Um, 
So I already mentioned a manifold. This just means a locally Euclidean space, so it's locally homeomorphic to Rn. Perhaps globally it has some topology. Uh, so I think I said Ramanian metric. Uh, Ramanian metric just means, okay, so at each point on this sort of local Euclidean space, you have a tangent space. And this is the vector space of directions you can move. Okay, so it's a flat space. Uh, to a flat space, you can associate an inner product, so like a dot product. Okay? But as you move around the tangent spaces, you're allowed to vary the dot product you're using. Okay, so the, a Ramanian metric is just some generalization of dot product. Um, okay, once you have a generalized dot product, you can measure the length of a path. So I have a map of a path into a manifold. And I'm going to measure the length just like I do in like Calc 3. I'm going to take the norm of the derivative at, e at each point and integrate. Okay? So this is just a, a straight generalization of the formula for path length you, you've seen in Calc 3, say. Um, all right, and then once again, there, there are between any two points in a space, there are many, many paths. You want to choose, you know, fixing the endpoints, you want to choose the shortest path, and that's what's called a geodesic. Okay, so it highly, this highly depends on the way you're measuring lengths. Um, and if I change the metric I'm using, the geodesics are gonna, are gonna be different. But the example I always have in the back of my head is sort of the simplest example, um, which is to take your manifold to be the two-sphere, okay, locally Euclidean, uh, then the tangent spaces are literally planes sitting in R3, and I can just restrict the, the usual dot product to those planes. Okay? Um, if I use that as my Ramanian metric, then the, the uh, geodesics or the optimal paths are great circle arcs, like, like we're used to. Okay? Um, and then, so I'm going to try to avoid as much technical details as possible, but Similar statements can be made in infinite dimensions, where instead of uh, a manifold being locally homeomorphic to, to Rn, it's locally homeomorphic to a function space, et cetera, et cetera. I think you can get away with just visualizing things as finite dimensional. Um, okay, so, so back to the idea where, where we have a shape manifold. Uh, geodesic distance gives us a distance metric. And so I, I know that plenty of distance metrics exist. Um, for protein shapes, but the idea here is that you're not only getting a distance metric, you're getting like lots of extra structure. You're getting these geodesic paths. Um, so the idea is, you know, now maybe the geodesic path itself has some biological uh, relevance. Uh, if you have a Ramanian metric lying around, you can make gradient descent precise. Um, with these geodesics, you're able to uh, define probability distributions on like ensembles of, um, of polymer shapes. So, so there's lots and lots of extra structure laying around if you get your metric from a Ramanian metric. Okay. All right, so does this idea seem somewhat feasible at least? Okay, um, so, so this is what I want to talk about and sort of explain how this really would work. Um, so so the, the thing that seems probably uh, not so promising is that if you're trying to find geodesics in a finite dimensional manifold, you can write that as solving some ODE with boundary conditions. If you're tr trying to find geodesics in an infinite dimensional manifold, it becomes a PDE, um, and it's nonlinear. So it seems like this may not be a very efficient sort of distance metric to compute, and I want to convince you that with the framework I have, it actually is very simple to compute. <coughs> Okay, um, so I, I, so the relevant thing to to proteins is shapes in R three, but I think things are a lot easier to visualize in the uh, and how these ideas developed over the past um, forty or so years for planar shapes. Okay, so so the this basic idea of having a shape manifold and using geodesic distance goes back to maybe the seventies uh, with Kendall, and his first idea was to okay, so I have my little dog shape again. Uh, I want to associate to this dog shape a point in some manifold. Um, his approach was to just take endpoints along, uh, along the shape, so some landmark points. Okay, so now my shape representation is actually a finite-sided polygon. Okay, um, th this seems a little bit pr uh, manageable, I think. And then remember, we want to identify if I take the shape and then scale it uniformly or 
rotate it or translate it, I want these to be considered the same shape, right? Um, okay, so then we have some mathematical formulation of what shape space should actually be. So this is the sort of manifold we want to think about. Uh, so what is this? Um, okay, so I'm going to take polygons with n vertices, and then I'm going to associate polygons that differ by a translation, scaling, or rotation. Okay, so, so by this uh, quotient, I just mean identify things that differ by these motions. I'm taking the quotient. Um, okay, so I can formulate that a little bit more precisely. If I, instead of keeping track of the landmark points, the vertices, I keep track of the edges of the polygon, then that automatically uh, removes translation. Okay, so that, um, because they're vectors then. So translating doesn't uh, change the vector representation. Uh, if I have n edges in my polygon, then this is a point in R2 to the n. Okay, so, so far just a high dimensional vector space. The thing that makes it a manifold, maybe it has some global topology, is if I just take n edges, there's no uh, guarantee that those form a closed polygon. So that's some constraint on the edges. And it's that they have to sum to zero. So I think of the concatenating the edges. So they should come back to where they started. Um, I also want to mod out by scaling. So that's just fixing the sum of the lengths of the edges. OK, so now there's like three, dimensional, three dimensions of constraint here. So that's turning this into a manifold. And then I also wanted to identify things up to rotation, which is uh, the orbits of this group, SO2. Okay, so, so this is the, the shape space that uh, Kendall was thinking about. Um, and it's some, you know, some sort of crazy uh, constrained manifold with a quotient thrown in. Um, maybe seems a little bit difficult to construct geodesics, but uh, in fact, you can, do, you can construct geodesics explicitly based on this result of Hausman and Knudsen, um, which was from the, the late 90s. So, okay, so I have some, whoops, some sort of shape space with some sort of crazy definition here. Uh, the, the takeaway is that this shape space actually is diffeomorphic um, or equivalent to a very nice manifold, okay? So this is a Grossmannian. Um, these come up all the time in all sorts of fields of math, uh, but you can think of it as the set of two-dimensional planes in Rn, okay? So... Fix Rn for each two-dimensional plane. I have a point in this Grossmannian. It turns out that that defines a manifold. And you can, you can write it like this if you want to maybe convince yourself of that. Um, OK, so I've, I've taken this sort of crazy shape space. I've identified it with this Grossmannian, which is very well understood. Um, so here are some facts about the Grossmannian that make this especially convenient. Uh, like I said, it's a compact manifold. Um, you can maybe convince yourself its dimension is 2n minus 4, looking at this definition and the constraints you have. Um, since we start, we can define the Grossmannian by starting in Rn squared. Uh, there's sort of a canonical Ramanian metric just coming from the usual dot product in this vector space. Okay, so it, it comes built, built in, like preloaded with a uh, very nice Ramani metric. It's very symmetric. Uh, and in fact, we can compute geodesics explicitly. So we can find um, shortest paths in this uh, crazy high dimensional manifold. I can really just write down a formula to do so. Okay, which you would probably not expect from the initial definition of the shape space. Um, and so. You know, we have a Ramani metric, so we have a distance metric induced by geodesic distance. Uh, you also get a volume measure because things are compact. Um, so overall, this is like a very nice situation to be in, in terms of the shape space. Um, okay, so yeah, so SN is compact smooth manifold uh, with compact smooth manifold with well understood geometry. It means we can explicitly calculate probability um, or do probabili probabilistic calculations. We can explicitly compute geodesics. Uh, here are some probabilistic results. Th these are sort of recent work with um, Jason Cantarella, who was my advisor, uh, Clay Schonkweiler, and Gavin Stewart. These are 
really just pure mathematical things, but I think they're sort of fun. Um, so for example, th this, this first uh, theorem, okay, so the probability that a random triangle is obtuse is this weird number, 3 halves minus log 8 over pi, with respect to this, uh, the induced volume measure on the Grassmannian. Uh, which is like 84%. So sort of interestingly, we, we started thinking about this because uh, this problem was posed in like this mathematical puzzle book written by Lewis Carroll. Uh, so he, he had some sort of ill-formed um, statement of this question and came up with a different answer based on not really having a probability measure that he was using. Um, and uh, over the years, there's been many answers to this. So with this, uh, with this volume measure, that's the answer. Yeah. Uh, big angle. Um, and then to, uh, sort of more seriously, or w w it's a little more involved to show that the probability if you take a random n-gon uh, that it's convex is 2 over n minus 1 factorial. Um, so this, this setup is very good for probability calculations. You can do these. These are all done essentially explicitly. Um, the problem is the geodesic interpretation doesn't really work so well. Okay, so if I want to use geodesic distance in the shape space as a measure of shape similarity, the problem is I chose these landmarks somewhat arbitrarily for this dog shape. So if I, these are different choices of landmarks, if I plug these into the shape space, these are going to have positive distance. Okay, so this is not recognizing things that are the same shape. That's an issue. Um, okay, so choosing landmarks seems to give us trouble sort of a, a reasonable solution, at least to me, would be to take infinitely many samples. Take all the samples, OK? Um, so if we take all the samples of the curves, uh, that's the same thing as just taking a parameterization of the curve, OK? So in this notation, I mean um, smooth maps of a circle into R2. So that's really you know, this shape. You can think of it as just a smooth map of the circle into R2. Um, and then there's. Uh, you know, sort of modding out by shape similarities. So translations, rotations, uh, and scaling. OK, so, so the, the main thing to notice is, like, really, I'm just going to think of shapes as parameterized curves now, taking infinitely many samples. Um, in the, I think it was 2008 or 2009, uh, Eunice, Mikor, um, Sean Mumford came up with this analogous result uh, that we had before for the shape space. The shape space is a finite dimensional Grassmannian. It's infinite. Uh, the smooth shape space is infinite dimensional, and it is equivalent to an infinite dimensional Grassmannian. OK? So here, it, it's the same definition, right? Um, this thing is an infinite dimensional vector space. OK? Uh, I can still take two dimensional subspaces of this vector space. To each of those, I say that's a point in this, in this Grassmannian. Um, so it's infinite dimensional, OK, that, that seems maybe uh, not so convenient. But in fact, the geometry of this thing is still very well behaved. And you can actually do explicit calculations. Um, yeah, so we can still compute explicit geodesics in this Grassmannian. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I propose this infinitely many samples idea to get around the problems with landmarks. I essentially have the same problem here. So, uh, Seems like sort of a downer so far, right? So uh, my fix still didn't work. Um, because this is choosing a specific parameterization of the shape. So the, the sort of heat coloring here is supposed to represent, uh, I can parameterize these curves differently. OK? I can compose this, um, I can compose gamma with a diffeomorphism of S1. And I'll get uh, the same exact shape visually, but they, these are represented as two different points in the Grassmannian. OK, so finally, uh, we get to the point where uh, I try to convince you that the fact that we're in infinite dimensions is actually a good thing now. Um, and I'm going to claim that this is a good thing because the space of all possible parameterizations has extra mathematical structure. OK? So like I said, to get a different parameterization, I want to compose one of these uh, maps with a diffeomorphism of S1, so just um, a self-map of S1, essentially. Uh, I'm going to denote the set of all those diffeomorphisms by this symbol. So this has extra mathematical structure. It's, called, uh, it's a Lie group, and it acts uh, 
by isometries, so it sort of respects the Ramanian metric of the Grossmannian. Um, the takeaway from this is that, okay, so, you know, mathematically you can find geodesics in the quotient space, but sort of practically uh, solving this issue with parameterizations boils down to an optimization problem, okay? And the, the sort of cartoon of how this would work is I have, um, so here's my infinite dimensional space of shapes, sort of the plane here. Um, these are supposed to represent the fibers of this, uh, oops, each. Um, sorry. These represent the fibers of this diff group. Okay, so each, so you know, this is a very cartoonish. The whole space is infinite dimensional. Each one of these lines is also infinite dimensional. But they, are, they do sort of um, divide up the space into these fibers, okay? And then the idea is I have, uh, you know, all sorts of parameterizations of this dog shape, likewise for the, the human shape, but I just want to search for sort of the closest parameterization in this total space, okay? And um, so, so the point is I can actually do this, okay? So you can actually figure out what the best parameterization is, and then the idea is now I can just write down explicit geodesics in the Grossmannian. So to sort of convince you how this framework works, um, here are some examples. Okay, so I have like a, a long-tailed horse and a short-tailed horse. These are shapes in the plane. Um, I want to compute the geodesic between these. So on the left, it's each of these is parameterized by arc length. So I've, I've chosen specific parameterizations. I'm going to compute the geodesic in the shape space. Uh, and you'll see that it, it looks like sort of insane, okay? So this is a path in the Grossmannian. It is actually optimal for the Grossmannian geometry, but it is obviously not doing what we want it to do. This is like not the, not the correct path somehow. And this is because I, I have this dependence on parameterization that is messing me up, okay? Um, well, that, that's sort of a heuristic thing, I guess. But um, maybe when I show you the next one, you'll think it's a correct path, and then that'll sort of be believable. Yeah, th there should be some sort of visual matching between uh, features, I would say. Right. So, all right. So, in the in the second example, let's see if this convinces you. Um, I've run this sort of uh, algorithm where I've searched over parameterizations. So I start with the arc length parameterization of the horse, and with some like optimal parameterization based on the algorithm, and then now this is the geodesic between those things. So I, I think you'll agree, at least heuristically, this seems like the right path. It's matching all the features of the horse and just sort of shrinking the tail. Okay, and then, um, so each geodesic is really computed in the total space, and you see by optimizing uh, parameterization, you, you reduce the geodesic distance. Okay, and, and the point here is like, there's no numerical solving of PDEs here. I can literally write down what these paths are explicitly. Okay. Um, okay, so, so that was sort of the planar story. Um, and hopefully the idea sort of came across about what I'm trying to do. That, that's sort of the flavor of the results we want to go for, is we want to take some shape space and then compare it to a classical manifold where I can actually uh, do explicit calculations. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, space curves, which I think uh, are the relevant thing here, um, as protein backbones say. For a variety of reasons, I want to not just think of space curves, but um, sort of decorated space curves. Okay, so I want to think of uh, these things called framed curves, which are, I'm going to take a parameterized space curve gamma, that's like uh, thinking of as the black curve here or the orange curve here. And then I'm going to decorate them with a normal vector field, OK? So I want to visualize these as like ribbons, or I, I usually think of them as sort of elastic rods, um, where you, know, you have your base curve, and then the normal vector field is telling you sort of how the, curve is, how the rod is twisted in some way. Um, so there are technical reasons for doing this that make the math come out easier, but it, it also gives you a lot of flexibility in how you're uh, understanding sort of these curve evolutions. So there's flexibility in how much you want to penalize like twisting deformations versus bending deformations. Um, and there's also extra, sort of an extra degree of freedom to play around with. And in applications, perhaps, uh, there's a reason you might want to use the framing, like adding extra structures to the protein backbones, something like this. 
<clears throat> okay, so then I'm going to take the collection of all of these frame curves. So take all frame curves up to scaling and translation. Once again, it's some huge infinite dimensional collection of stuff that seems somewhat hopeless to actually get your hands on. And then uh, the theorem is that in the spirit of, of the other couple of theorems I've shown you, um, this sort of crazy shape space actually has the geometry of a, of a classical manifold, essentially. Okay? So it's locally diffeomorphic to the Hilbert sphere. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in particular, it's the space of curves in C2 that have uh, L2 norm equal to 1. That, it's not super important exactly what it is. The, the point is that it's a sphere. It's an infinite dimensional sphere, okay, but it's a sphere that has very nice geometry. Okay, so it comes with a natural Ramanian metric. I can write down geodesic paths. I can do uh, all sorts of things on the sphere because the geometry is like extremely symmetric um, and easy to get your hands on. Okay, um, just like before, I really don't. I I, I want to get over the the problem of that I'm parametrizing these things. Okay, which is sort of unnatural. Um, I want to match different parameterizations of the same curve to each other as being distant zero. I can do that using the same sort of algorithm I described earlier. Um, I can mod out by rotation, so this is giving optimal registrations between the curves over rotations. Uh, there's one extra sort of technical thing is that I have this extra degree of freedom with the framing uh, roaming around. If I don't care about that, I can get rid of it, actually. Because, once again, because it has uh, extra mathematical structure, this is once again a Lie group. I have the same sort of uh, weird cartoon that's really infinite dimensional. But I can find sort of, just like I found optimal parameterizations, I can find optimal framings. Okay? So now these fibers are the same base curve, but I can twist up the framing however I want along this fiber. I want to search for sort of the nearest guy amongst these fibers. Okay, um, so let's take a look at how these things look. Uh, now, once again, these are these helical structures are, are good for illustrative purposes, I think. So I'm going to go from a uh, short helix to a helix with some big long tail on it. This is once again. Um, so these have a particular choice of framings. They're Frenet framings, if you're familiar with that. Uh, they're both arc length parametrized. This is sort of not optimizing over anything. Okay, so this is a geodesic in this infinite dimensional sphere. It is some path between them. It is optimal in the sphere, but it's not optimized over the fibers correctly. So it once again looks sort of crazy. Uh, it's sort of like crunching up and going through all the singular stuff and then unfolding itself. And that, that's, that's what the sphere wants it to do. Okay, fair enough. But then I go through and I do um, all my little optimization cartoon things here. Uh, and then in the second example, everything's optimized. So I look at the path here. And once again, the features are, are sort of matched correctly. Okay, So this sort of feels more optimal in a, in a heuristic sense. And in, in fact, it, it decreases geodesic distance by quite a bit in the Hilbert sphere. Um, you can see that this is optimized over parameterizations and framings. Uh, so the end, let's compare the endpoints. So the endpoint on the left is like the Frenet framing of the helical structure. On the right, there's like an extra little twist at the end here. Okay, so that helps us avoid going through singularities. It's sort of um, converting like the writhing of the curve to a twist at the end, and different parameterizations, which is sort of hard to show. Right, um, but yeah, but the base curve is is exactly the same uh, geometrically. That's right. Yeah, because they're, so now it gets a little bit complicated um, where the number of times that the frame twists around actually uh, matters a lot more. So by optimizing the framing on the right, I've added a little twist at the end, and that lets me avoid going through a singularity. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, good. Okay, so, so basically the point is I can, and once again, this is not uh, numerically solving a PDE or anything. This is literally I can write down what these paths are explicitly. Um, okay, so, so, so the take 
takeaway here is this uh, manifold of framed curves. Um, I can do calcul explicit calculations very easily based on this uh, identification. Um, okay, so now, so I have very little uh, experimental evidence to show you guys, sorry. Um, but I tried to throw some in to at least fit, uh, fit in a little bit more. Um, okay, so he here's a, uh, an experiment done by uh, Lee Srivastava and Zhang. Um, so they were using not exactly this framework that I'm using here, so th but they're using a similar sort of infinite dimensional Ramanian metric with the same sort of, sort of uh, matching parameterizations um, procedure. Uh, so so th they use the square root velocity framework, which was invented by Srivastava. They've done lots and lots of work um, in shape matching using these ideas. But anyway, so, so they uh, just did this clustering experiment on protein backbones from the SCOP database. They clustered a bunch of proteins into four families and just um, essentially recorded how accurate the results were. And compared to uh, more classical methods like combinatorial extension or MAT, uh, and you can see, so here's the overall accuracy. Um, so this is their infinite dimensional approach. It's about 92%. Whereas uh, CE was like maybe 93% and MAT was like 88%. So it's comparable in uh, accuracy. And then if you compare the running time, since everything is explicit, uh, the running time, even though the infinite dimensional weird geometry stuff seems like it should be sort of harder computationally, um, actually is much faster. Um. <coughs> okay, so, and then, so. Uh, said they were using a, a different Ramanian metric on curve space, essentially. Uh, so I just ran sort of a little baby experiment and picked um, 20 proteins off the PDB. Uh, I picked them knowing sort of that they fell into groups of structural similarity, as listed here, um, and then ran clustering with their metric and with my metric. Uh, you can see that there's a, their clustering is like much tighter, um, and it, it picks up it picks up these groups exactly here. Uh, so my method also picks up essentially all the groups, um, like 18, 19, 6, 7, 8, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 14, 15. So it picks up most of the groups. Uh, it's a little bit more ambiguous over here. So it's really picking up, it's really grouping things close together really when they're very, very close structurally. Um, and you'll notice that there's like a, the main inaccuracy in this paper was uh, false positive, so potentially this would uh, be sort of a, another check against false positives in that it's only going to group things together uh, that are really very close in shape. Uh, and there's some other interesting things that get picked up, like for example, in their clustering, one in 12. Are cl so I, I know what these proteins are if you're interested in what the actual proteins are. But um, so, th so they, they clustered together one in 12 most closely, whereas mine clustered one in 20. Um, so I'd be interested if there's uh, some actual biological reason you might expect um, the structures of whatever proteins these are to be similar. But the conclusion is that uh, you know choosing different Ramanian metrics on curve space, as you would expect, gives you different clustering behavior. Um, so I'll come back to this at the end, but it would be nice if there were sort of more of a variety of Ramanian metrics to choose from. <coughs> um, Okay, and then, so I want to say a few things about closed curves. So uh, really the framework that I've developed is particularly suited to closed curves um, as well. So th this would be interesting for matching like uh, ring polymers or things like this. Um, so let me just sort of quickly say how this works. Um, so now we're going to be thinking first about polygons in space, so n-sided po closed polygons in three space. Uh, <coughs> So this is a, a theorem of Hausman and Knudsen and sort of Howard Mann and Milson put together that um, the space of closed polygons in three space is still a Grassmannian. Now we've replaced this Rn with a Cn, so complex n space. So the extra degrees of freedom somehow um, translate into being a Grassmannian in, uh, in a complex vector space. <coughs> Um, so one immediate consequence of this result is it's very easy to sample closed random walks using this model because it's literally, I just need to sample this Grassmannian. Um, 
And to sample a Grassmannian is very simple because I can just uh, sort of pick two vectors in CN, orthonormalize them, that gives me a two-plane. <clears throat> um, OK, so easy to sample random walks. Uh, there's been a lot of work using this idea by Cantarella, Schonkweiler, Deguchi, many collaborators. Um, well, they, they really have a very robust theory of these random walks using this idea. Uh, they get exact probabilistic calculations, like expected total curvature, radius of gyration. Uh, and then they've gone on to, to get into some very sophisticated mathematics uh, using symplectic geometry to study equilateral random walks. Um, so it's very interesting stuff. Uh, but then, so this last result here says, if you sort of follow the line of, of, of this um, sort of philosophy of you should take your shape space and relate it to a classical manifold, uh, this sort of completes the story here. Um, so remember, the first result was that uh, sort of n-sided polygons in the plane is a real Grassmannian. Then that the infinite dimensional version of that was an infinite dimensional real Grassmannian. Then from the previous slide, space polygons correspond to a complex Grassmannian. And finally, um, the space of smooth closed frame curves is an infinite dimensional complex Grassmannian. Okay, and then, so well, once again, this, this gives you explicit geodesics. Uh, these look a little bit interesting, I think. So here's, um, so you can, you can see a few things about this, I guess. First of all, it doesn't respect topology. Okay, so I'm taking a trefoil knot and sort of passing it through itself to an unknot. Um, you, can sort of, you can see some other features here. So this is uh, not optimizing parameterizations or frames. It, it looks sort of nice and symmetric, um, but you see that it, it once again goes through singular points at, at sort of these corners, where it's passing the frame through itself to deal with uh, this twisting issue. Um, <clears throat> then on the other hand, after doing the optimization, it's less symmetric, but it sort of is matching features correctly. So it's matching, uh, let's go back to the beginning. So it's matching like one of the loops of the trefoil with a circular arc in the uh, eventual circle. Um, and li like I said, I've, I've optimized over parameterizations and framing, so you'll notice the endpoints look different. Well, the frame's sort of on the back of the sky. It's just uh, sort of pointing straight out from the circle. Here, the frame is all twisted up, and this is sort of optimal because the original frame of the trefoil was twisted up, obviously. And, it's, it's, and if you look at one more time, um, the twists in the end results sort of match the torsion points of the trefoil. <coughs> Okay, um, so let me uh, say one more result here that's going to um, sort of tie back to the idea of maybe we want multiple different types of Ramanian metrics. Uh, okay, so what, one, one last sort of technical thing here. Sorry, this will be the last thing. Um, if you're wondering, so I I've sort of brushed this under the rug what the actual metrics we're using look like. So if you're interested, interested in that, uh, there's this two-parameter family of metrics that um, have been popular for using these planar shape recognition algorithms. OK, so this is for planar curves. So it's a Ramanian metric. I'm supposed to be able to take a planar curve and a vector field along the planar curve. That's like a tangent vector. And uh, plug that into the metric and get out a number. And the number looks like this. Uh, so this is the tangent vector to the original curve. This is the normal vector. And then I'm going to sort of compare deformations. So heuristically, what you should think of is this, is com this term uh, is looking at the stretching deformations of the vector field. And this term is looking at the bending deformations. OK? And then we're going to integrate. So it sort of looks like an L2 metric. Um, but in any case, I can stick in two vector fields, get out a number. And this is my Ramanian metric. Uh, the results we've seen so far, so Srivastava, as I said, has done a lot with these um, elastic shape matching algorithms. So they are always using the square root velocity framework, which uses the parameter choice b over a as 1 half. OK. Uh, the Eunice, Mikor, Sean, Mumford result that we saw earlier was using uh, b over a equals 1, specifically. And so far, that's like the only two parameter choices anybody's been able to work with. Um, so here's a, a uh, 
result really in progress, so we're writing this paper right now, but we come up with some coordinate transformation where we can work with uh, all parameter choices, so the full two-parameter family. Um, <clears throat> and a, a, as some slight evidence why this might be an interesting thing to do is we just did this sort of simple experiment. We took um, signature data, so these are open plane curves, and uh, so we have some big database of these signatures, and we just uh, try to classify signatures by nearest neighbor calculations. And then we did this over various ratios of B over A. And you see sort of one is, oops, ah. One is uh, the Eunice Mich Mikor, Sean Mumford parameter choice. This actually performs sort of badly. Um, Neo Srivastava Yoshi is at one half. This is performing much better. But then it, apparently, as you change parameter choices, there's some like best parameter choice for classifying. Um, so the conjecture is, based on how the proof of this theorem goes, that you should be able to do the same thing for space curves. And then we're going to have some uh, three or four parameter family of metrics that um, compare stretching deformations bending deformations, and sort of twisting deformations of these frame curves. Uh, and the idea is that um, there should probably be some optimal parameter choice for doing things like matching uh, protein backbones. OK, um, so th that's one sort of future direction is to try to, try to prove a conjecture like this. Uh, there are many other potential future directions here. Um, lots of work to do. and I, I potentially be uh, interested in talking with people about um, the first one here. If there's any suggestions for an experiment that might uh, be more convincing to a biology community that this is sort of the right thing to do. Um, so uh, please talk to me if you have any suggestions about this. Uh, but I think instead of going through these, I'll just uh, end there and say thanks for listening. <clears throat>